Can you game on a PC without a dedicated graphics card in 2021? Well, on one of these systems, yeah, you can. And on the other, not so much. I'll tell you which one is which and why. Let's do this. Hey guys, welcome to Elevated Systems. I'm your host, CJ, and many of you are probably aware that Intel released their new 11th gen core desktop CPUs last week, and maybe many of you weren't really too excited about the launch. I mean, it is a talk, or is it a tick? It's been so long since Intel ticked or talked, I don't remember which is which off the top of my head. In any case, while it's a new architecture, it's still the same 14 nanometer process node that Intel's been using since six generation CPUs. In the case of the 11th gen, Intel just took the micro architecture from their 12th gen Sunny Cove 10 nanometer CPUs, which should actually be out later this year, and stuck it in their current 14 nanometer Skylake CPU. And called it Cypress Cove, I think. It gets confusing even for me, and this is kind of my job, so let's look at it in a more relatable architectural term. Basically, from generation six through 10, Intel has been building the same house with the same room layout and just rearranging the furniture inside from generation to generation to improve the feng shui. For 11th gen, they built the same house, but with a whole new room layout. But that room layout was meant for a smaller house, so getting from room to room takes more energy than it should. Now, I knew all this, and I pretty much knew what to expect as far as performance with the 11th gen CPU, so that's why I wasn't too excited about the Cypress Cove CPU cores but I was a little excited about Rocket Lake S. That statement may have confused some of you because Rocket Lake S is the code name for 11th gen Intel CPUs, which is built on the Cypress Cove microarchitecture. And that's true, but the 11th gen CPUs also contain new integrated graphics based on Intel's XE graphics core, which is essentially the same microarchitecture as Intel's soon to be available maybe dedicated graphics cards, which is what excited me about the 11th gen CPUs and why I bought this i5-11400. This is the bottom of the 11th gen six core 12 thread i5 product stack, but it contains Intel HD Graphics 730. Now, I wanted to get an 11500 or 11600 with the HD Graphics 750, but I couldn't find the 11500 for pre-order and I knew every big reviewer out there was getting an 11600K and an 11900K in their press pack. Plus, with a price point of about $184 on this CPU, I figured it might be a decent price to perform its CPU. So while today I'm just testing the integrated graphics on this CPU, I will be doing a full benchmark and real world test of the CPU itself comparing it to its predecessor, the i5-10400, and from Team Red, the Ryzen 3600X and 5600X. So be sure to get subscribed and hit that notification bell so you don't miss that. But the plan today is to see if after many generations of Intel's integrated graphics, while being superior in the areas of video encoding and decoding and compute operations, is the new Iris Xe-based iGPU capable of some lower to mid-range gaming. And because I never test anything by itself in a vacuum, I of course have something to compare it to. This is the Ryzen 5 Pro 4650G 6 core 12 thread CPU with Radeon RX Vega 7 graphics on board. Now, this is an OEM only CPU, which means they're only intended to be sold to system integrators for use in pre-built PCs, but the market is flooded with them. I got this one on eBay from Korea for about $235, but you can even buy them on Amazon if you're willing to pay a bit more. So let's go over the specs of these two CPUs and test system setups and parameters. 
Let's start with the i5-10400. This is a six core, 12-thread processor with a base frequency of 2.6 gigahertz, a max turbo frequency of 4.4 gigahertz, and 12 megabytes of cache. It supports dual-channel DDR4 memory up to 3200 megahertz with a max capacity of 128 gigabytes and a max bandwidth of 50 gigabytes per second. It is PCIe 4.0 compatible and supports up to 20 PCIe Express lanes. The integrated UHD Graphics 730 operates on a base clock of 350 megahertz with a max dynamic frequency of 1300 megahertz. It can share up to 64 gigabytes or half of installed system memory. It officially supports up to three displays with a max resolution of 5120 pixels by 3200 pixels at 60 Hertz. The Ryzen 5 Pro 4650G is also a six core 12 thread CPU with a base frequency of 3.7 gigahertz and a max frequency of 4.2 gigahertz and eight megabytes of L3 cache. It supports dual channel DDR4 memory up to 3200 megahertz with a max capacity of 128 gigabytes. The integrated Radeon RX Vega 7 core graphics operates at a frequency of 1900 megahertz. So these are the CPUs or iGPUs to be tested. Let's look at the test systems. The Intel CPU is on an ASUS ROG Strix B560A gaming Wi-Fi motherboard in a fractal Meshify 2 compact case cooled by a Vetro 240mm AIO and powered by a Be Quiet Straight Power 11 650 watt power supply. The 4650G is strapped onto an ASUS Prime X570 Pro in a Be Quiet Pure Base 500DX, cooled by a Lian Li 240mm AIO and powered by a Corsair CX750 MPSU. Now, both systems use the same 32GB 2x16GB sticks of G-Skill DDR4 3200MHz CL16 Trident Z memory, a 500GB Samsung 960 EVO M.2 NVMe SSD for a boot drive, and a 2TB 2.4-inch SanDisk SSD as a game library. And just to state the obvious, neither of these systems has a dedicated graphics card installed. As far as testing parameters, I'm testing both of these CPUs completely at stock settings. The only setting I'm applying in the UEFI is the XMP profile for the memory, and I'm using the RAMs profile, not the motherboard XMP profile available on these ASUS motherboards. Any other motherboard specific enhancements were deactivating, allowing the CPU to regulate itself. Now, even with that, I did notice a few things. First, the Ryzen 4650G's CPU and GPU clocks boosted higher than stock, up to 4.3 GHz for the CPU and up to 2.3 GHz on the GPU. This could just be a reporting error. It is an OEM CPU, so who knows, but all applications were consistent in the reporting. Now, for the Intel CPU, I have no idea what the GPU clock was running at, as despite the latest versions of all my monitoring software, GPU-Z, Cupid Hardware Monitor, A 64 Afterburner, etc., none of them would register the GPU stats other than percentage used. I even tried the Intel CPU tweaking software, or whatever it's called, but I just got a system does not meet requirements error when trying to install it. Okay. I think it's time to jump into the benchmarks, but before I put up the charts, I'm going to do something a bit different, well, for me anyway, and include some side-by-side -side gaming or benchmark footage because, spoiler alert, one of these CPUs just failed as a standalone gaming CPU, and there's really no better way to show that than to just show it. The i5-11400 footage is on the left and the 4650G on the right. Real-time stats are overlaid and I'll just let you watch as there's no commentary required here.
Okay, after that, these graphs should come as no surprise and we'll start with the synthetic benchmarks. The primary benchmark is the 3D Mark Night Raid at the bottom of the chart, which is the benchmark made for CPUs with integrated graphics. And here we see that while the new UHD Graphics 730 does have an 18% uplift over the previous UHD Graphics 630 in the i5-10400, the Ryzen 5 4650G graphic score is about 1.3 times higher or 136% higher than the i5-11400. Moving up to Firestrike, here we see the biggest margin improvement for the 11400 over the 10400 of 47%, while the 4650G again has a lead of 134%. Superposition and Time Spy, the most taxing of these tests, showed an increase for the AMD graphics over the Intel graphics of 167 and 164% respectively. Overall, while the newer Intel iGPU did average a 32% gain over the previous generation, it fell behind the Vega 7 iGPU by over 140% on average. Moving on to actual gaming benchmarks, the first thing to note is that the Shadow of the Tomb Raider, Star Wars Jedi Fallen Order, Call of Duty Warzone, and Doom Eternal all failed to launch on the Intel CPU. Both Tomb Raider and Warzone both froze on the opening splash screen, while Jedi and Doom executables failed to even launch. I tried using both the Intel UHD graphics driver and the generic Microsoft display driver, but both had the same results. Now the big takeaway from this chart is that the only game I would even consider playable on the Intel iGPU is Rocket League. While Everything from Doom Eternal down was playable with average frame rates of over 60 on the AMD iGPU. Overall, the frame rate for the Ryzen 4650G was 159% higher than the i5-11400 on average for the seven games that I was able to get benchmark scores for both. Okay guys, I don't think there's much to say in regards to a conclusion other than what I said in the opener, this Ryzen 5 Pro 4650G is the CPU or APU you can use in an APU only gaming system. Now, is it ideal? Are you gonna be doing super competitive gaming or getting great frame rates on new AAA titles? No, but if you're like a lot of people living in GPU hell right now, hoping to get your hands on a new GPU at some point, this is a good placeholder. It's also a six core 12 thread CPU, roughly equivalent to the Ryzen 5 3600. So we'll give about that level of performance when you finally can pair it with a modern GPU. As far as the i5-11400, this is not a good option for a CPU-only gaming rig. And while it is a step up from previous iGPU generations, the 24 low-power GPU EUs, or execution units as Intel calls them, just don't seem to be powerful enough to drive anything but the most basic games. I'm not sure what this says about Intel's forthcoming XE Iris dedicated graphics cards. I think the first one releasing has 80 high power EUs. I guess we'll see. Now, all of these results may have been obvious to many of you watching. And to be honest, after seeing the only slight improvements in Intel's mobile CPUs with Iris XE integrated graphics as far as gaming, I feared these would be the results, but I was hopeful. I always root for the underdog. It's still weird to me that that's Intel now. On the other hand, when both of these are paired with a dedicated graphics card, the 11400 should outperform the 4650G and even the R5 3600 in gaming performance. I'm pretty sure it won't reach the level of the 5600X, but Considering it's about $115 cheaper, it may be to in cost per frame. That's coming up next, guys. I'll be plugging in a graphics card into each of these systems and running a full suite of productivity and gaming benchmarks. 
I also just received the most powerful, on paper anyway, APU available, the 8-core 16-thread Ryzen 7 4700G. I had to buy an entire computer to get it, but I'll be taking a look at the progression of the Ryzen APUs from the 2-core Athlons all the way to the 8-core 4700G. But that's it for this one, guys. I hope you learned something. That is why I do what I do. If so, please consider hitting that thumbs up. And as always, I hope to see you in the next one. Until then, stay safe.